Hello friends, welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Thank you for taking the time to join us every week as we walk through a wonderful study guide entitled Education, which is the fourth quarter theme. But today we're talking about the Christian and work. Everybody has a work to do. We're going to talk about the specifics of work today. If you'd like a copy of the lesson to follow along, go to absg.adventist.org and download a digital copy. But if you want to be a part of a study group, look for a local Seventh-day Adventist church. Walk in and say, 3ABN sent you, and sit down and enjoy an excursion through the Word of God. What you need for this study today is a Bible and some time. So thank you for joining us. We're about to get started in God's Word, and we thank you for joining us today. Welcome, friends. We are so thankful that you've taken the time to join us. We could not do this without you, so thank you for your prayers and all your financial support. And if you come to volunteer here, that's a step above. Thank you so much for taking the time to get your Bibles and your lessons. And we're going to introduce you to our family today as we walk through a lesson entitled The Christian and Work. Everybody likes work, I think. We'll find out today more specifically whether or not you like work or whether or not that's something that you might uh, want to elude you in the annals of life. To my immediate left is Pastor John Dinsey. Good to have you here today, my brother. It's a blessing to be here, and it's always a blessing to see what God is doing through His servants. Amen. Shelley? I'm excited to be here with my brothers and sister. That's right. Miss Shelley Quinn, I want to make sure that if somebody's tuning in, they don't just know you as Shelley. Thank and you. Jill Morcone, our COO and Vice President of 3ABN, good to have you here. Thank you, Pastor John. Always a joy to study the Word of God. And if you don't know who she is, she's the list lady. That's right. <laughs> and to my far left, the singer in Israel, Ryan Day, Pastor Ryan Day, good to have you here, Ryan. Amen. It's a blessing to be here, brother, always. He's the evangelist personified. Mm. He's always ready to preach, teach, and do whatever comes uh, to the spiritual table, and we thank you for that, Ryan. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go into the Word of God, but we're going to ask the Lord to bless us as we go before His throne of grace and prayer. Pastor Denzi? Sure, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving and wonderful Heavenly mm -hmm. Father, we do thank you because the Scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. But Lord, it is a vain effort to seek to understand them without the aid of your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We ask and plead that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit that we may not only understand but communicate the message you have for your children. We ask you for them as well, that you will lead them in their understanding and in making decisions to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The Christian and work. Now let's look at our memory text. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. And I'm going to read that in your hearing. And the Bible tells us the following. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Uh, there's a saying that goes, whatever we do for self will pass, whatever we do for Christ will last. Yes. And that's the reality of it, because everything in this world, no matter how diligent you are in labor, if it's for things that are temporary, those things are going to pass away. But if it's for the kingdom of God, that's a kingdom that will never, never end. You know, the lesson was well put together. And what I like about this lesson, it is very practical. Did you notice that? A lot of practical topics, and work is a very practical topic. Uh, now we're, we're in the midst of uh, still solving what we might refer to as a, a disease that just showed up and it's deciding when it's going to leave and we're doing our part. There's a lot of work in trying to get rid of it. But when you think about the work of the kingdom, work was God's idea. The way the author of this lesson said it, it says, in the ideal world before sin, God gave Adam and Eve the task of caring for the garden. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Now, we specifically talked about Adam being in the garden, uh, but Eve's housework, if you think about it, was also in the garden because they didn't have a two-story, uh, two-car garage with a basement and a walkout. <laughs> they didn't have that. They had the best accommodations with all the accoutrements of heaven. The master builder gave them a garden. They didn't need air freshener because they had flowers that will never die. Mm -hmm. They had a perfect setting. They had animals that will come and go. And that at that time, the animals did not fear humanity. But when sin came in, the entire atmosphere changed drastically. Genesis 2.15 describes the kind of work that God gave to Adam in the unfallen setting. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Adam was the first gardener. I would say Adam had a green thumb. <laughs> now, can you imagine? I think about it this way because, you know, ladies like flowers. Some guys like flowers but mostly maybe ladies like flowers. But can you imagine picking a flower that just doesn't lose its pungent mm. fragrance? It just, it, it's not in a dying state because death was not a part of that environment. Yeah. It just continues to go and go. It's like one of those potent air fresheners. What a setting to be in. But when sin entered the world, the work didn't end, but another component was added to it. Look at Genesis 3 and verse 19. The Bible says in Genesis 3, 19, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Mm. Notice the direction of what happens when we die was introduced into this verse. Mm -hmm. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Right off the bat, the Lord made it very clear. You're not going to heaven because you didn't come from heaven. You came from the dust. When your work is done, that's where you're going, right back to the dust. Right. But the wise man, Solomon, gives us the kind of attitude that we should have about work. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 9, verse 9. There's an attitude that comes along with work. And uh, it's beautiful. You know, there are people that are comfortable in the, in the boardroom. There are other people that are comfortable in the, in the field. <laughs> There are people that love to be on tractors. There are people that just don't even consider being in the outdoors when it comes to work. But notice the attitude that Solomon tells us we should all possess when it comes to work. Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. You have that, Jill? Mm-hmm. Read, read that for us. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he has given you under the sun, all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life and in the labor which you perform under the sun. Isn't that amazing how he, instead of saying, uh, with the wife you love all the days of your life, he said all the days of your vain life. <laughs> because the wise man said, when you look at the scope of humanity, it's all vanity. Right. Everything. My wife and I were sitting once on the edge of our bed in, in a hotel room and I was putting a camera card in the camera, those micro SDs, mm. and it dropped on the bed, and I picked it up. I said, look at that. It's amazing how small they made these things, 128 gigabytes. And I said, you know what, honey? We can't even, we can't even take that to heaven. We can't even take that to heaven. Everything we have, we can't take any of it. And I, that's why the wise man said it's vanity. All the things we work for and labor for and, and are diligent about, we can't even take it with us. Mm -hmm. But now let's go to the Christian side. On the topic of Christian work, I think the author was referring to that more specifically. One of the greatest challenges that the church faces is Christians that don't feel the need to work. Mm. And we know Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, mm -hmm. lest any man should boast. And they kind of leave it right there and say, well, that's good enough for me. But don't forget verse 10. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 10. That's right. Mm -hmm. For we are his workmanship, That's right. created in Christ Jesus for good works, That's right. which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The saying that came to my mind when I read this text is the work of salvation belongs to God. The work of the saved belongs to us. Mm, that's good. The work of salvation belongs to God. The work of the saved belongs to us. The Lord has hired us to work in his vineyard. Amen. And when we think about that, we cannot sidetrack the idea that, well, we don't have anything to do because James makes it clear. Go to James chapter 2. Look at verse 14 to 17. 
Now, the Christian that doesn't feel the conviction to work really doesn't have a viable commitment to the Lord because that commitment is validated by work. Mm -hmm. Notice this, That's right. verse 14 to 17. What does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith and does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? Dead. Is dead. So somebody might say, hey, I'm a great baseball player. What team do you play for? Well, I don't play for a team. I just like baseball. Have you ever played before? No, I just like baseball. Have you ever swung a bat before? No, <laughs> I just like baseball. I have a ton of baseball uniforms, a lot of baseball bats, baseball gloves. You don't play for any team? No, I just like to have the paraphernalia of the baseball team. No <laughs> baseball coach would have any use for that kind of individual. Do you agree, Ryan? <laughs> That's spot I mean, on. who wants a person that just likes the uniform? That's the case with the Christian. The uniform is the righteousness of Christ. Mm -hmm. How dare we take on his uniform and his mission was to do the work of the father who sent him. That's good. Mm -hmm. As the father sent him, he says, so send I you. Mm -hmm. I send you forth as laborers into the vineyard. I send you forth as lambs among wolves. The work is not easy as a Christian, but the work is the validation of our commitment to Christ. Without work, you don't really have a relationship with Christ. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter three. Verse 12 to 13, you'll discover there that true happiness comes in working for the Lord. Work is the one investment that the Bible tells us brings true happiness. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 12 and 13. Do you have that, Ryan? I do. Read that for me. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labors. It is the gift of God. But this is the gift of God. So the joy of your labors. If you work, hey, you'll benefit. There's a text. I don't have it in front of me. I think I'll find it for the end of the lesson. But it was in, in the book of Proverbs. It says, the lazy man says, there's a lion in the street and he'll devour me if I go out. <laughs> the lazy man says that. Some people said, I can't find a job. I said, how are you looking with a remote in your hand and a game controller? Ah, I, I sent a couple of job applications. I didn't get any responses. Man, get out there and beat the pavement. We live in a society today that's developing people into lazy individuals trying to find a work with a remote and a game controller. Or some people are settled with Facebook. That's their job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, if you work for Facebook, that's a different story. But if Facebook works you, that's a whole nother ball game. Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse 10. The Bible talks about the kind of attitude we should have mm -hmm. when it comes to work. I love this passage because this is also along the line of the living know that they will die. Mm -hmm. Notice verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. might. Do it for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom, once again, mm -hmm. in the grave where you are going. When you die, there's no money, no more jobs. There's no employment in the grave. But the Bible does believe in work. You know, the fourth commandment talks about work in two contexts. One, in, a, in Exodus 20, verse 9, six days you shall labor. Yes. So from Sunday to Friday, that's labor days. Mm -hmm. But when the Sabbath comes, verse 10, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. So let me settle the argument. The Sabbath is not salvation by works. The Sabbath is when work ceases to rest mm. in the relationship with Christ. Right. So John makes it very, very clear. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. John 9 and verse 4. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Excellent. Well, we continue in Monday's lesson, which now we have uh, the lesson entitled Work and Nurture. Work and nurture, this is Monday's part. And this uh, aspect of working is very important. You already uh, read Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, uh, in which we are encouraged that whatever we find to do, we are supposed to do the best we can, as hard as we can, work. Now, I've been around a little while, and I have seen uh, people uh, avoid work. 
<laughs> and some are very good at it, uh, as I've seen in, in uh, uh, working in different places. But I uh, praise the Lord that he has given us work to do. It is a blessing to work and to work knowing that uh, there's a goal in mind. Uh, my father was a believer in hard work and he uh, would encourage us to work. He, he says, he would say, uh, the Bible says he who does not work should not eat. And so <laughs> he would uh, mention oh, that yes. to us uh, uh, very uh, much as well as saying that the lazy people have to work twice as hard because sometimes mm -hmm. they try to do something the easy way mm -hmm. and then they have to redo it because it doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. uh, Colossians chapter 3 is the next uh, verse I want to point to, uh, verses 23 and 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and right. not mm -hmm. to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, this is something important to understand because whatever your job is, whether you work in a school, in a hospital, wherever you work, we are to work heartily. And it says, as to the Lord. Yes, you have supervisors. Yes, you have a company you're working for. And there's a purpose uh, for working so that you can put, as, as people say, food upon your table. But we are to work because, uh, really, the Christian that works in any, any atmosphere is representing God. Mm -hmm. And you have to consider that um, Matthew chapter 5, when it says, um, let your light therefore so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. A Christian that works in an environment where there are people that are not Christians are to do their best because they are representing the, they are representing the Christians in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember many times hearing examples of people where they, um, they, they asked, uh, uh, are you a Christian? No. Are you a Christian? No. Are you a Christian? No. Are you a Christian? Yes. Okay, you're going to be in charge of the money <laughs> because they believe Christians will not steal. I remember when our car, uh, our car broke down uh, once and we took it here to the local. We went to see Philip. Uh, mm -hmm. You guys know Philip oh, yeah. at the local gas station. And uh, there was a serious problem with our vehicle. And uh, he has a very small shop there. And he says, you have a serious problem with your engine. And we can't do that here. Uh, I want to encourage you to go into Benton. And uh, you, he, he mentioned the name of the place. He said, you'll see a lot of cars there because there are people just waiting to get their car serviced by them because they're Christians and they will not lie to you and they'll be reasonable. I said, wow, what a recommendation he gave of this particular place that I will not mention by name. But Christians should have the best reputation for good workers, honesty, and they are representing the Lord. Now, nature has good information for us many lessons for us to learn. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Notice, go to the ant, you sluggard. <laughs> wow. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. So we see here that God has a message for us that we should not be lazy or sluggard, the way it calls here. We are all called to put our best effort forward to accomplish a task. Now... The Bible also shows us that there is satisfa satisfaction and we enjoy the things that we work for. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses, verse 24. Nothing is better for a man that he should eat and drink, that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. Hmm. This also I saw was from the hand of God. God blesses our efforts. When, when we do our best, He will bless our efforts. He will supply the needs of our homes. And so, now we uh, want to show you something important, very important as well, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse, eight, verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He 
who gives you power to get wealth, mm -hmm. and that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. God is the one that gives us health and strength. God is the one that gives us power to work to him be honor and glory. Amen. And so with this comes the thanksgiving that we should express by bringing to the Lord offerings and even tithe as he uh, in, instructs us to do. Now, there is doing work, working hard, doing the best we can, but also there is temperance. We need mm -hmm. to understand that we need to take a break. And so I point you to Mark chapter 6, verse 31. Even Jesus that worked hard from early in the morning till late at night, he understood the necessity of taking rest. So in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, Jesus speaking to his disciples, he's, and he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Mm -hmm. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. <laughs> and so sometimes things are this way. A lot of uh, demand is placed upon you. They didn't even have time to eat. But there's a need to go aside, rest a while, get refreshed, recuperate. Uh, because unfortunately, some people are prone to become workaholic. Mm -hmm. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. The Lord is good. If it wasn't for the blessing of work, imagine uh, after sin entered into the world, how horrible things would be. People would have basically no work to do. Their minds uh, would be continually trying to find something evil to do. But God gives us time to work, and it is for us to take advantage of the opportunity God gives to us. Now, I want to uh, read this to you. It is uh, from Acts of the Apostles 352. Work is a blessing, mm. not a curse. Some people look at it as a curse. They don't want to even get up. Uh, work is a blessing, not a curse. A spirit of indolence, of laziness, that's what that means, destroys godliness and grieves the spirit of God. So if you find it difficult to get up and get going, ask the Lord to give you strength. It continues here. Let me go back. It says, a stagnant pool is offensive, but a pure flowing stream spreads health and gladness over the land. Paul knew that those who neglect physical work soon became enfeebled. He desired to teach young ministers that by working with their hands, by bringing into exercise their muscles and sinew, they would become strong to endure the toils and privations that awaited them in the gospel field. And he realized that his own teaching, teachings would lack vitality and force if he did not keep all parts of the system properly exercised. Mm -hmm. And so the, to, in today's world, there are people that have what you call mental work to do. This, they are sitting in office before a computer and they don't have much physical activity unless they go out into doing something at home, some work at home, helping around the house, doing yard work. This is very important because your body needs the exercise to keep you in a healthy condition. I know of a minister that he was uh, a very hardworking minister. Most of his work was studying the Bible, getting ready for messages. He would visit people in their homes, but he was not exercising and he had a heart attack. He was eating wonderful as well. And he had a heart attack and that's what the doctors told him. How much exercise do you do? Well, I, I don't. And so that created a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Physical activity is important. If, so if you have a work that is sedentary, mm -hmm. I mean, then you should look for opportunities to get physical exercise as well. A balance. We need to be temperate in all things. So the scriptures give us guidance. Even in nature, you find the example. We already told you about the ants. There are many others examples we find in nature because work is part of the necessity of our lives to keep ourselves in healthy conditions and provide for our families. Thanks be to the Lord that gives us power Amen. to work. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Johnny. That was wonderful. You know, we're talking about the Christian and work. And so far we have talked about two aspects of it, but we have three more to cover. So don't go away. We'll be right back. <music> 
Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our Sabbath School panel. We go to Tuesday now, Work and Excellence. Shelley, it's yours. Okay. You know, we might wonder why is a quarterly that is focused on education suddenly giving a whole, devoting a whole lesson to work? Well, I want to speak to your parents and your grandparents at home. It's because you need to educate your children to work. The two most important things you can do is as a parent or a grandparent, is to teach your children to have an intimate love relationship with the Lord. That's first. But second is give them a good work ethic. Mm -hmm. In today's world, we are bombarded by so much information and so many media sources that a lot of youth are developing the attention span of a hummingbird. And you know, what's sad is that the vast majority of people are satisfied with a mediocre existence. Right. They are not striving for excellence. But when we think about our God, our God is love, He is yeah. holy, He is magnificent. Excellence is rooted in His character. And He calls us to excellence. He created us in His image mm -hmm. and anything He calls us to be, He will cause us to be. Good. God is looking, calling us to excellence, not to perfectionism, get that straight, but to excellence. He wants to maximize our created potential. And there's three specific areas of excellence he calls us to. Moral excellence, uh, relational excellence, and vocational excellence. So let's quickly look at that. Uh, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. God calls us to moral excellence, to be above reproach. But guess what? He's the one that's going to equip us. He does. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 said, His divine power has given to us, how much? All, All, All things. things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue by which have given, been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these, through these promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature, mm -hmm. having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Mm -hmm. So God equips us to have moral excellence. It doesn't mean that we don't make an effort because he goes on and he talks about to this, we, because of this, we should be diligent to add to our faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, which brings us to the second call to what we would say is relational excellence. This is the basis of God's covenant. God wants us to be loyal, to be loving, to practice fidelity and interdependence with Him and the community of faith. God is calling us to love Him, to love our neighbors, to, to be excellent as a spouse, excellent as parents, even for, if you think about this, friends, students, or an employer, employee. Now let's get to the lesson. God calls us to vocational excellence. He equips us with creativity and eloquence and He wants our diligence. He wants us to focus and to pursue excellence in everything we do. Mm -hmm. I was brought up, if anything is worth doing, it's worth doing well. well. Right. So let's look at Exodus, ex, excellence, Exodus chapter 25. And we're going to read 
Uh, we'll begin with verse 8. Exodus 25, verse 8. God is speaking to Moses. He says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The purpose of the covenant, and it has always been God's purpose, I will be your God. You shall be my people. But you know, this is a big deal that he is asking Moses to have them build him a sanctuary because this is something really big in the experience of the nation's understanding of God's transcendence. Here God lives up in heaven, but his eminence that he is going to dwell with them. Now then verse 9 says, according to all, we're going to build a sanctuary, according to all, all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furnishings, just so you shall make it. You know, it's interesting. The primary focus of worship was in this design. I mean, as I've said before, this, this was theology in physical form. God gives a very detailed blueprint for the tabernacle. There's 150 points of things, point by point, what they need mm -hmm. to do. Even uh, just to, for Moses to follow, uh, to build a, t a temple, mm -hmm. there was a seven, I mean, a table. It was a seven step mm -hmm. procedure. And you know, the origin of the tabernacle, if you look at Hebrews 8, 5, the origin of the tabernacle was found in God and delivered to Moses by special revelation. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 8, 5 is talking about the tabernacle of, that Moses built, but he, it says it serves as the copy and shadow mm -hmm. of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. God had them use, I mean, it's an impeccable design. They use the best materials, mm -hmm. but then God provided the artisans mm -hmm. and the craftsmen with the ability to accomplish it. He filled them with the Holy Spirit. We're not going to take time to read that, but you can read Exodus 31, 1 through 6. Exodus 35, 30 through Exodus 36, 1. He, he gave them the ability. Now, our lesson says, and this is a quote from the quarterly, thus being fallen sinful humanity or humans is not a valid excuse mm -hmm. for treating any task with anything less than utmost dedication. God expects us to perform at our best, mm -hmm. putting our talents, our skills, our time and education to good use for great causes. How can we pursue excellence? I'm going to give you four Ps. Mm -hmm. We pray for the Holy Spirit, purify our thoughts, practice what you learn and press on. We pray for the Holy Spirit. And, and that's the most important thing you can do every morning is pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's something that God wants to do. You look at Luke 11. Purify our thoughts and practice what you learn. Philippians 4, 8 through 9 covers both of those. It says, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence, honorable and seemly, whatever is just and pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there is any virtue and excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on and obviously I'm reading from the Amplified, and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your mind on these good things. Purify your thoughts. But look at verse 9. Practice what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Model your way of living on it, and the God of peace will be with you. 
So the fourth P is press on. Philippians 3, 12 through 14, again from the Amplified. Paul says, not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to hold, take hold and make my own that for which Jesus Christ the Messiah has laid hold of me. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet, but one thing I do, my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shelly. Each one of you, I love that work and excellence. Work is a gift. That's right. Yes, it is. Given by God himself to Adam and Eve in the garden before sin. Pastor John, as you talked right. about, I love that. Wednesday, we have work and spirituality. Bringing spirituality into everything you do. There is this concept of compartmentalization and integration. We won't even get into that. The only thing I want to reference that is that some people compartmentalize their spiritual life. In other words, they say, I'm a Christian on Sabbath when I go to church, or maybe you go to church on Sunday, whatever day you go to church. I'm a Christian when I go to church. The rest of the week, I'm not a Christian or I don't bring spirituality and religion into my life. However, God calls us to be 24 seven Christians. Mm -hmm. Christianity, Jesus should pervade every aspect of our lives. Following Jesus is not something I put on when certain people are around. It's not something I wear at certain times and then take off. It's not something I only do at church or with certain people. Following Jesus should impact how I speak, how I think, who I am, and how I work. That's what we look at here on Wednesday's lesson is integrating spirituality into everything we do. Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything we do mm -hmm. should be done for the glory of God. So how do you manifest spirituality in the day-to-day -day tasks of everyday life? That's just a practical question. How are you even supposed to do that? The lesson talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and we're going there. I'm calling it four steps to bring spirituality into my life, mm -hmm. into all of my life, not just when I go to church Sabbath morning. Right. Step number one is to abide in Him. Amen. This is the condition for fruitfulness, is that we abide in Him. John 15, before we go to Galatians, we're going to John 15. John 15 verse 1 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Jump down to verse 4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. just a few things. No, right. nothing. Without Jesus we can do nothing. So he, we are the branches and we receive life-giving power to be fruitful, to walk in him, to bring that spirituality into our life. That comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Number two. Choose whom you serve. Now we're going to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. This talks about the war between the flesh and the spirit. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. It's interesting the contrast between the flesh and the spirit, mm -hmm. between self-centered living, or I call it flesh-filled living. Mm -hmm. And I've been there and done that many times. On the other side, we have Christ-centered living or spirit-filled living. Self-centered is controlled by passion. Christ-centered is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Self-centered is a slave to sin. Christ-centered dies to self and sin. Self-centered shows the fruit of sin. 
Christ-centered shows the fruit of the Spirit. Self-centered walks in lust. Christ-centered walks in love, that self-sacrificing love. Self-centered is an idolater. They live for themselves. Christ-centered lives for other people. So we need to make a choice. Who are we going to serve, the flesh or the spirit? Romans 6, 16 says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that right. one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So every morning when we get up, we want to connect again to the vine. That's the Lord Jesus Christ and say, God, I give you my life. I choose to follow you today. Because if we don't do that and don't submit throughout the day, turning back to Jesus and asking him into our hearts, choosing him when we face those decisions or when the flesh tends to rise up, turn back to him. If we don't do that, we're going leading to sin and that leads to death. We want that path of obedience leading to righteousness and that comes about as a result of whom we serve. Number three, walk in the spirit. Now we get the fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5, 16, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now let's read the fruit of the spirit, those nine fruit. Verse 22 and 23, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I always couple the fruit of the spirit in three sections. You have the first three, love, joy, and peace toward God. You have the second three, patience, kindness, and goodness. That's fruit exhibited toward your brothers and sisters. Then you have the final three, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I always think of it as fruit turned inward, meaning it's how I deal with myself. Mm -hmm. The first three, love, joy, and peace. What is that love? That love is agape love, self-sacrificing love. Of course, we don't have that love. We ask God for his love. We accept it by faith, knowing that he can give it to us. And we actively reach out in loving ways to other people. What about the second fruit, the joy? Happiness is earthly because happiness is dependent on circumstances. But joy, true joy that comes from the Lord is not dependent on what That's goes true. on around you. Psalm 16, 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Yeah. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What does that mean? When we are in his presence, we walk in joy. Third fruit, peace. Peace comes from being justified with God. That's Romans 5, 1. Peace comes from Jesus in our hearts. That's Romans 15, 13. Peace comes from keeping my mind, my thoughts stayed upon him. That's Isaiah 26, verse 3. What about the next three fruit? Turn toward others. We have patience. Ooh, accepting God's will and timing. Endurance. Contentment flexibility. We have kindness. I always think of kindness, Pastor Ryan, as being about my attitude. Right. And then we have goodness, and I always think of goodness as being about my actions. So kindness is my attitude, goodness my actions. We have the last three, faithfulness, the character of one who can be relied on, gentleness or humility. Meekness is not weakness. Gentleness is not without power. It just chooses to defer to others. It forgives others, corrects with kindness, and lives in tranquility. And the final fruit, self-control. True self-control is not br about bringing myself under my own control, but about being under the power of Christ. So I always rename that fruit. Instead of self-control, I call it Christ control, meaning <laughs> I submit to him. And he's the one who does that work in me. The fourth step and final step is to crucify the flesh. We're to walk in the fruit of the spirit, but we are called to crucify the flesh. Mm -hmm. Galatians 5, 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. When we crucify the flesh, that power is destroyed utterly. And then what follows a list of the works of the flesh. We won't read them all, and it is not an exhaustive list because there's a lot of works of the flesh, but it's an illustrative list. The first four deal with sensuality and immorality. 
That's in verse 19, the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, which is impurity, lewdness, which is unbridled lust. Then we have next idolatry. We have sorcery or witchcraft. And then the next nine are all selfishness, hatred, contention, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, envy, murders, dissensions, heresies. The last two deal with intemperance, drunkenness, and revelries. The point of all of this, I don't know about you, but I have walked in some of those works of the flesh, but God, by the power of his spirit, says, I can change you. Connect to me as the vine. Choose every moment of every day to follow me, and I will work in you the fruit of the spirit. Mm. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you all so much. That was such a blessing. Um, I have Thursday's lesson entitled Work and Stewardship. And, uh, you know, I'm going to focus, a, I'm going to take a little bit of a, uh, more of an emphasis on the stewardship area, but I'm going to fold it into the work because you guys have just been work, 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 work up to this point, which is the purpose of this lesson. Um, but I'm going to emphasize a little bit more towards the stewardship because stewardship is a work in ministry. It's a work in our relationship with the Lord. And so I just want to highlight or identify what it is that stewardship is. And this is a very simple uh, definition, but st a steward is a person entrusted with the management of another person's property. In this case, all belongs to God. <laughs> Everything belongs to God. In fact, there's only one thing that we own in this lifetime, and that's our sin. And Jesus wants that too. <laughs> Jesus died for that and he wants us to turn that over to him too. But he allows us to own that if we want it. And I had a friend to say something to me one time, very simple, but very profound. He said, why in the world would you want to die for your sins when Jesus has already died for them, right? Uh, Jesus owns everything and we are just here. We are stewards. We are managers of his property. And, you know, it kind of, I really related to this because, uh, you know, I've, I'm still, still relatively a young man, but I've been in ministry now, praise God, for a few years. But before I was in ministry, I had the wonderful privilege of being in the workforce and in the, in the work field uh, in a non-ministry setting. And much of that was management. I was in management. And when you're in management, you have a big responsibility. It's a, it's a very, very important work. And essentially what you're doing is you're managing, and you're a steward. When you're a manager of anything, no matter what type of, of workforce or, or job, or, or whatever you're involved in, you are, a, you are a steward. You are managing another person's property or managing, managing another person's business or affairs. And so in this case, God has entrusted us. He's given us a special work and he's calling us. He's saying, hey, this is mine. I want to freely give it to you, but can I count you faithful? Can I trust you? When thinking of stewardship, though, many people automatically go to tithing, <laughs> right? Because you think of money, right? Uh, and then while tithing is a very important aspect of stewardship, there is much more uh, to being a good steward than just the money side of things. And that's what we're going to kind of go in right now. Uh, God has given us all special gifts and, uh, and, and we must accept and trust in him as the Lord of our lives with these special gifts. And Peter kind of gives us some insight as to how God views us. We're not just people. We're not just these little tiny ants running around, you know, in some big giant God up there. God is a personal God. And in this case, he views us as a very, very special people to his heart. In fact, notice first Peter, I want to go to first Peter chapter two, just read a couple of texts here just to kind of set the foundation here. Uh, first Peter chapter two, I'm going to start reading in verse five. And he says here very clearly, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. How does, he, how does he see us? He sees us as a holy priesthood to offer up, notice this, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now jump down to verse 9. This is that famous one that, that I, I love this verse. It's one of my favorite verses. He says, but you, this is personal, all of us, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light. God is so good to us. And he takes all that he has. He says, it's all mine. All that cattle out there. I own all the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all mine. But you know what? I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to make you a manager over my stuff. And what's mine is yours. <laughs> The truth is, or the, the, the question is, can we be faithful as stewards in the work that God has given us? Stewardship right. and work is a multi-dimensional aspect of the Christian life that includes 
us putting to proper use what God has entrusted us to manage. And so I want to kind of look at just many different ways that we can be a good steward. First of all, the time that God gives us. It's not our time. Mm -hmm. We are on borrowed time. We're on God's time. We are right. stewards of the time that God has given us. I love Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. The Bible says, so teach us to number our days Amen. that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Another one, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 17. You know what? Many of us, uh, we're, we're kind of misusing and abusing the time that God has given us. And we have a special counsel here from the wisest man to ever live other than Jesus. He says here, do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish, for why should you die before your time? Mm -hmm. We also have James chapter 4, verse 14, which is another special text that highlights the importance of the time that we have here that God has entrusted to us as his faithful servants. It says in verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow for what is your life it is even a vapor that appears for a time and then vanishes away so we are the stewards of the time that God has given us we're also stewards of the talents that God has given us and, and I hear every time I say this and when I would preach this on the road I had people come up to me and say you know you know you, you've got all these talents I don't have any talent no, everyone's got talents. Everyone has a special gift and ability that God has given just you for you to use for his glory. And I love Exodus chapter 35. We were talking about, I love Shelly, how you brought out the temple, the building of the sanctuary and how God said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Even God made God, made his people, these, 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 these people uh, in control and managers over building his own house. Yeah. And so I love this text here, Exodus 35, in, in reference to uh, of the building of his house. He said, all, this is Exodus 35, verse 10, all who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. He, he bestowed that special responsibility upon those to build his house. He made them a steward over his house. That's awesome. Right. And, and when they were to exercise the talents and the gifts that he gave them to do so. First Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. This is another one. We're, we're, going, we're going rapid fire here. So here we go. Go. It says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as, as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do uh, it as with the ability which God supplies. Notice how the emphasis is on God. God gives it. God supplies it. It's coming by God's grace. Yeah. Right. That in all things, I love this, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the emphasis is on God. Why does God give us these gifts? So that we can bring glory to him. Right. And many of us have, been, have all these talents. We have these special gifts. And some of us are out there wasting it on the world, wasting it on the devil. My friends, if you're at home and God has given you a special gift and you're watching this program right now, use it for Jesus. Amen. Use it for the glory of God because that's why he gave it to you. Amen. He gave it so that he might receive the glory. We are stewards over all of God's property. Get this, even including ourselves, mm -hmm. our bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are God. So God gives us this body. He says, look, I created you for my glory. I've purchased it with my blood on a cross. And what we put into it, what we put on it, Inside and out matters, my friends. I, you know, I see people, I know we live in a generation where some people don't know better, but you have others out there that are just very careless with God's property and they just put anything and everything on it, you know, markings and tattoos and etchings. And my friends, you, you, are, you are damaging God's property. Pray that the Lord will give you victory over that and to open your eyes to see that we are all servants of the Lord and this is his property. Right. Here's an important one. We are stewards of the people and the family that God blesses us with. Mm. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, mm. and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's strong. Yeah, God blesses men and women and people with family, with, with the people that he has blessed you with. And it is, we are stewards. We are managers of that family. That's why it's important. And I'm just giving this as an example for a father to lead his home in the Lord, to lead his family in the Lord and pr to provide uh, for their needs. Uh, this, this next one I want to bring out, God, of course, this is the one you knew was coming. We are, we are stewards of God's 
money, God's resources. And again, this list that I'm giving is, it's, I recognize it could be much more complex than this, but for the time giving, we'll just I, I bring this out and emphasize it. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. This is the one that comes to mind. Anytime you're thinking of returning to God, I don't really like saying paying tithe. I don't pay tithe. No, we don't. Right. You don't pay tithe. You know, you're, not, you're, not, you're not paying God anything. You're returning to God what's already His. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And he says, test me on this. Try me, says the Lord. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. That's why I love the story in Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4 of the little widow. Jesus is observing all these people bringing the, the, the tithe into the treasury and he sees all these people putting their money in, you know, the rich people and the wealthy people. And here comes this little widow with her two mites. That's all she had. And she put it in there. And there's a powerful lesson to learn here. I just want to say this in the closing moments. There's someone out there that's going to say, well, I don't, I don't return tithe because I don't trust the wicked people who, you know, manage this or whatever. I don't pay to the conference or I don't do this. At the end of the day, my friends, we have to be reminded that, you know, he, Jesus could have stopped that little widow and said, hey, don't give your money to these foolish Pharisees. They're all wicked. They're going to crucify me in three years. They're going to do all this. They're going to do all of that. But because it was a responsibility, not just for him, but for her and everyone to return what is God's. We are stewards of God's property. He has given us the ability to manage it. Let's be faithful in all things and work and be a good steward. Amen. Yes. Okay. Pastor Denzi, can be an overview of what you covered. Well, the blessing of work. Work is a blessing that God has given us. But whatever your work is in this life, take Jesus with you and let him shine through you. Amen and amen. My day was work and excellence. Just remember that God calls us and equips us for moral excellence, relational excellence, and vocational excellence. And you can pursue that by praying for the Holy Spirit, purifying your thoughts, putting into practice what you learn, and pressing onward. Amen. Amen. Wednesday, you. work and spirituality. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit. We are called to bear fruit for his glory. Mm. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Therefore, whatever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. It is our job to make sure that whatever we do in stewardship, to be faithful to the Lord, that we do it all to God's glory, not our own. Yeah. That's right. Thank you all for covering that. You know, we all are called to work for the kingdom of God. And there are a couple of passages I wanted to add in the beginning, but I'll add them before we close. Uh, Matthew 25, 21. This is what all of us, every one of us wants to hear when Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful, faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And then Revelation 22, 12, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So as the song says to him, work for the night is coming. That's what God has called us to do. We must pray that we respond to the voice of the vine dresser, the voice of the one who owns the harvest fields and go forth as laborers into the field. Join us for the next lesson, lesson number 12, Sabbath, experiencing and living the character of God. Until then, may you work only to be the one to give glory to God. See you next time.